Good afternoon, Better Realtors. Welcome to Protecting Your Buyer's Money. And notice the little money signs underneath our, our little title page. I want to welcome all our Better Realtors and our Better Real Estate students um, to Better Homes and Gardens Lunch and Learn for Thursday, um, August 6th. We're really excited about this topic because right now with multiple offers and, and all the hectic way the market is, we want to make sure that you are protecting your buyer's money or that your buyer understands that they're risking their money. We wanna make sure of both of those things, that you're protecting their money, and that for sure the buyer understands and you've communicated you know, their earnest monies and ways to protect that. Before we get started, I wanna remind all of our better realtors that we are safe realtors. And I know right now this mask wearing thing has become kind of political, and I know that the hand sanitizer that we're all using is starting to dry out our hands, but um, washing hands, hand sanitizer, socially distancing, and definitely wearing masks are very, very important in our business. And it just shows that you're another level of professionalism that makes you a much better realtor. And so I really want to emphasize that no matter how your client feels, no matter what the seller's requirements are to see the house are, it is very, very smart in today's world to wear a mask. We have Literally, one of our agents here has had a family member pass away um, with COVID. It was a grandpa, but only in his 70s. And then I personally know of a 23-year-old who spent nine days in the hospital. So this is a real disease and we are in a real pandemic. And, and uh, essential services is housing. We want to make sure that we don't have incidences where one of us as realtors are spreading it or, or, or one of us gets sick. So please, please keep the safety measures in mind. So. On to protecting your buyer's money. Okay, I've divided this into several categories. And the reason that we're having this discussion, um, the reason that we're, uh, we're having this discussion about the eight ways to protect your buyer's money is because we have had incidences where, where the buyer's earnest money has been in question. And then the buyers themselves are wanting to either go to small claims court or go and see an attorney and, and make sure they don't lose their money. And I believe us as realtors, it's our job to make sure that they are very, very aware of what's going on with their earnest money and, and, and also their inspection money, their appraisal money. We want to protect your buyer's money. Okay, so this is going to be, we're going to try to keep this at a half an hour. So it's a quick lunch and learn for people to be able to watch this video later for the people who can't attend. Um, we, we, what's so nice about this is that, that many, many people can watch these recordings even after the actual lunch and learn itself. So it might be a dinner and learn, it might be a Saturday morning and learn, but it, anyway, so there are eight ways to protect your buyer's money. Number one, you need to have an in-depth buyer consultation meeting before you begin in looking at homes. Um, I'm just gonna go briefly through these and then we'll go in depth Second, a multiple offer discussion with all the options you have when offering. Third, discussion of earnest money amount and the earnest money willing, you're willing to give up. Fourth, seller's disclosure, dates, discussion, and reminder. Five, inspection date, cost, and discussion reminder. Six, addendum with clause if not accepted contract cancel. Seven, appraisal and financing date, cost, discussion, and reminder. And eight, buyer's notice of cancellation, before the deadlines, not the day of the deadlines or after 5 p.m. the day of the deadlines. So those are the first, uh, the first ones I wanted, first things we wanted to discuss. So in-depth discussion, buyer consultation. I am a huge believer in having a buyer consultation. It is awesome when someone picks up the phone and calls us and says, hey, can you show me this house today? We get all excited and we want to run out and show them the home right away. Now this could be a previous buyer, it could be um, a friend of a friend's, it could be someone in our SOI, it could be a sign call, and we just wanna run right out and show that home. And, and sometimes we do. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that, but for safety reasons and also for uh, to, the opportunity to have a full discussion about what's going on in the market right now, we should really try to have a buyer's consultation because most of the time that buyer, when we run out and show it, is not pre-approved and really not ready to go and buy. 
Um, it's a great way to meet new people if they're calling off of our, our listing signs, but it's also, there's a certain level of safety and a certain level of, of financial concern. And we wanna use our hours that we work in a, in a smart way. So I always have a buyer's consultation and that's a whole different class. It could be 10 classes to be quite honest with you. But I like to have a full discussion about what's going on with the market, with their own approval, um, as far as financing, their, the way they're going to pay for it, how much money they have down. Um, I like to go over the buyer broker agreement and have a signed buyer broker agreement. I like to make sure they're pre-approved. I like to verify that all the funds they're going to put down, that I have a copy of that account so I can use that as leverage when I'm, when I'm presenting the offer to the sellers. And I like to discuss earnest money because in today's market with the multiple offers, the normal $500 earnest money is not it's not going to probably cut it. So I like to have a full blown buyer consultation. And I want you guys to kind of sit down and look through the greenhouse. There's a great buyer consultation little platform that you can use. I like to do the buyer consultation live, but you can also do it by Zoom. Um, and I like to set them up with a fairway mortgage because I found with all my transactions with fairway mortgage, everything closes on time, which is awesome because I've not had that in the past. All right, so multiple offers. I like to have the full discussion of multiple offers. Right now, pretty much in Davis County below 400, 450, and in Weber County probably below 400 or 350, we are experiencing multiple offers. A couple of things that are going on is people think that the market is going to crash, but we have statistics showing that we have way more buyers than sellers. And so you can have the supply and demand discussion with them how we have a shortage of supply and we have a high amount of demand. Um, this is an excellent place to purchase a home here in Weber, Davis County, all of Northern Utah, quite frankly, Box Elder, Morgan, and even areas north of the Idaho border are experiencing multiple offers. So I like to have a huge discussion about what makes your offer strong and also what we do in multiple offers and, and also the ability to run out and show a home as quickly as possible, that sort of thing. I like when I list a home, to be honest with you, to give um, a, 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 a certain period of time that the house will be shown and a certain period of time that the offer should be received and a certain period of time that the offers will be responded to. I believe that that's the most professional way to do this. So if you're on the listing side, um, discuss that with your sellers and discuss you know, limiting the amount of time they're gonna show say they're gonna list it on a Thursday, show the home on the Friday and Saturday and, and maybe even the Sunday, um, have all the offers in by noon or 5 p.m. on a Monday and review all the offers and respond by say 5 p.m. on a Tuesday. I believe that that's what better realtors do. I've noticed in the MLS that when there's a frantic trying to get in there to show it and the big lines outside and all of that, that it's just not as professional. And so I believe having an, at least having at least one open house for, so you can pick up buyers. But the other thing is to, to also to be able to allow a lot of people to see it at the same time. Obviously, by using safety measures during that time and social distancing, one family at a time, no children, all sorts of things like that. Okay, make sure whatever way you do this, though, is always fair and always practicing the fair housing. Um, so earnest money. During the buyer consultation, I have a huge discussion regarding earnest money. Earnest money in the old days used to be 1% of the asking price. So on a $250,000 home, you know, it would be $2,500. Sometimes people, because a lot of those people in those price ranges don't have that kind of money, will just use a standard $1,000 or $500. I really believe that we really need to have a big discussion with them. The earnest money goes to their closing costs and their down payment. And if we are really smart and we're not risking their earnest money, it's, 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 it's okay to give more. I'm thinking in those higher price ranges, five to $10,000 is not uncommon nowadays, but we again, do not want to lose their earnest money. So let's take a look at, we're gonna take a quick look uh, at, the, at the actual purchase contract itself and go over sections at the top of the REPSI, section 8.3 and section 8.4. So we're gonna take a look at those right now. Um, let me just pull those up. Okay, let's pull this over a little bit. 
make it a little bit bigger. So this is the actual real estate purchase contract for homes. This is the most common one we use. Of course, this applies to land and commercial also. Commercial is not as hot of a market right now. Land is definitely a hot market. So real estate, especially if it's a buildable lot. The real estate purchase contract at the very top, it mentions the earnest money. And it mentions that this, you know, who the buyer is and who the seller is. And you can look up the seller on the tax information. And I always add or owner of record, just in case the tax information has not been updated. This is the amount you put. It is collected for calendar days. So if you write the offer on a Saturday and it's accepted on the Saturday, it's four calendar days. If you write the offer on a Thursday and accept and it's accepted on a Saturday, it's four calendar days. So keep in mind, and you wanna provide that proof of earnest money because people will lose that first position offer if you don't get that earnest money in right away. So that's the first section where we discuss earnest money. Now we go down here into the section eight area and that's the next place we discuss earnest money, okay? Now, as we know, we can make it contingent on inspection. We can make it contingent on seller's disclosures and, and depending on how badly you're, how, you, and how low of a price range your client's going in at, will depend on whether you wanna use those conditions. And that's another thing to discuss during the buyer consultation. But right down here um, in section 8.3, the buyer has the right to cancel before the, if, if, um, and if they, if they are willing, they have the right to cancel based upon financing and appraisal, right? And they may say that so much money of the buyer's earnest money shall be released to the seller, okay? This makes your offer a little bit better of an offer. So just say I have $5,000 worth of earnest money, but I'm willing to say my buyer is, and after a huge explanation to my buyer, they're willing to risk a thousand of it just for them to, to just let them get in there and get that offer accepted, okay? The, the sellers like that. The sellers like that, oh, if we take our house off the market or we have to go to our backup offer and you cancel, we're gonna get $1,000 or we're gonna get $2,000 or we're gonna get $500. This area here, section 8.3B1 or B Roman numeral I, um, this is where you can make your offer a bit better of an offer if your buyer is willing to acknowledge that they're gonna lose their earnest money. If I write an offer like that, I also have my buyer initial here in the margin that I've explained that to them, okay? I do that for my own, my own safety because sometimes buyers have a, a, a short memory. So I will put it right over here that we've discussed it thoroughly, discussed and initialed by the buyer, okay? So they understand, hey, to make my offer better, I'm going to risk blah, blah, blah amount of my earnest money and if I should back out during this financing and appraisal deadline, I'm going to give the sellers this much of my earnest money. And then it just becomes non-disputable. Does that make sense? So hopefully it does. Um, on the next one, um, the next area is additional earnest money. So I might say, okay, I'm gonna give additional earnest money of, of another $4,000. Just say my buyer has $50,000 down and they've got $10,000 earnest money. And they're gonna say, I'm gonna give additional earnest money um, if section 8.2, 8.1, 8.2, and 8.3 is, and I no later than the due diligence deadline, the buyer will or will not give additional earnest money. Some clients like this because they feel like if they get right up past the financing and appraisal deadline, they, this is a way that some sellers can, can feel more like your buyer is really, really serious. So those are the areas in which earnest money can be protected and, and, and should be receded based upon the, 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 the contract. All right, so let's go back on over here to my, to my um, actual presentation. All right, so we've covered all of this. The top of the REPSI, how much? The section 8.3 BI, the release of the earnest money, uh, or some of the earnest money, and section 8.4, additional earnest money. All right, the next way is the seller's disclosure deadline. Um, I really believe that we can protect our seller, our buyer's monies, are their inspection monies and their appraisal monies if we make sure we thoroughly look at the seller's disclosures, okay? And the seller's disclosures, by the way, are not just the seller's disclosure form and the lead-based paint. There are other 
disclosures, title disclosures, CC and R disclosures, um, and we go over what those are during our buyer consultation and when we're actually writing the offer. There is a whole section in section seven of the REPSI, and I'm not gonna go back to the REPSI because of the interest of time, but read that whole section, section seven. And it's best to review all those before the buyer pays for an inspection, okay? Inspections can cost anywhere from $250 to $400 or more if they're gonna do a meth inspection, a radon inspection, all those different inspections. And I like to discuss all of that during the seller's disclosure date. So. I usually make the seller's disclosure date right now anywhere from four to seven days, all right? And hopefully if you're on the listing side, you attach as much as you possibly can to the actual listing, those little listing, um, the paperwork that you can attach to the listing. And, and hopefully if, if you're on the buyer side, a lot of stuff is already attached and can be reviewed before the offer is even written. All right, inspection date. I always highly recommend an ins inspection. And no, a home warranty is not a substitute for a home inspection. So a lot of times agents will turn around and say, well, it's okay if you're worried about the heater or the air conditioner or the dishwasher or these things, because they're covered with the home warranty. Well, make sure you read the home warranty fine print. And also, please don't say that, because what if it's not? Guess who they're gonna come and knock on your door and ask you about? If only a certain portion is covered by the home warranty, or it's obvious the, the filter hasn't even been replaced in the, the heater and in, in the heating system for gosh, years, that could null and void the warranty on that system. So I do not say that the home warranty is a substitute for inspection. Please never, ever, ever say that. Please never, ever, 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 ever say that. Um, Inspection companies, I always recommend, even if you've waived your inspection in your offer in order to get your offer, um, that we do still do an inspection. You can always get out due to financing and appraisal. Um, you can be there or not be there, and you can cover, you can show the different costs. Like I said, they could be anywhere from 200 to 50 to upwards of $500, depending on what they're going to do. I allow them to discuss that with the home inspection company. I do not offer advice on what types of inspections they should get, all right? Um, because I don't want to deter them from getting a radon inspection and then find out they have radon. I don't want to deter them from getting a meth inspection because it's a nice high-end home and there's meth in the home. Don't be deceived based upon area or price of home on what type of inspections they need to get. You can waive it at offer, but make sure you just go through all the risks. The risk is this is that your buyer will get a full blown inspection and not buy the home, but then you're gonna to need to get out. And that's in section date, the date sections in section 24B, um, negotiating repairs and all of that. We're gonna go ahead and look at a couple of forms in the seller res resolution of due diligence. A lot of people don't understand these forms. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at them now. So let me, um, let me just go ahead and share my screen. Um, Okay, here we go. So let's get out of here. And we'll go over here to our forms again. Slide those over. Okay, so if you do an inspection and it's contingent on the inspection, just make this a little bit bigger. Okay, if you do, I, and I know sometimes things with words are harder to see. Um, okay. All right, so this is the buyer's notice of cancellation and you can cancel based upon, prior to the due diligence deadline, you can cancel um, prior to the financing and appraisal deadline. When you cancel, stick to this form. Don't cancel based upon, oh, we're canceling because the air conditioner is broken. Um, uh, let me just fix this. I'm not sure if you can see this or not, so I want to make sure you can. I'm going to do it this way. Okay, I think I should be in the window now. Okay, so um, buyer's notice of cancellation. 
You can pick any one of these reasons. Do not do it verbally. It doesn't count if it's done verbally. It doesn't count if it's done by text. An extension verbally, it does not count. Um, all of that can be, uh, let me share my screen again here because I have a feeling it's not showing up on my screen. Some technical difficulties. All right, here we go. Should be able to see it now. So this is the buyer's notice of cancellation. Please know this. Again, you cannot cancel on text. You cannot cancel based on a phone conversation. And it doesn't matter if they've acknowledged your text, okay? That's kind of a myth. Texts are not contractual. Only forms are contractual. So I wanna make sure everybody's aware of that. I've had a long discussion with the UAR legal department on this, and I serve on the grievance and the professional standards committee. And we, we can't save someone's earnest money based on a text conversation. I'm sorry, but that's just a myth that's out there. Everything is always contractual. So the buyer's notice of cancellation, this is the ways that you can cancel. I do not go into great length if you're canceling based upon inspection or great length if you're cance canceling based on financing condition, okay? Now, if you don't wanna cancel, then you can use this form, resolution of due diligence. And at this point, you can mention repairs or you can mention a rejection in purchase price. You can ask for some additional closing costs if you want. Um, there's all sorts of different ways and there's also a resolution if those repairs are not finished by the time you close. So this is another great form to use. So we have three forms if we're canceling, okay? Buyer's notice of cancellation, resolution of due diligence, or contingent. Now this one is the one that if you're trying to keep the contract alive and you don't and you, and you want to extend the deadline so you have more time to discuss it or you want to extend and you want to also include the notice of cancellation. Notice here, in sec so you can, section one, you can extend the due diligence and you can extend the financing and appraisal. In section two, you can put a notice of cancellation and for any reason, the seller does not accept the terms of this addendum in its entirety, um, then you can, you can, it's automatically canceled, okay? And the deadline to accept this addendum is always going to be before the date of your section 24 on the REPSI's deadline. Okay, so don't go right up to the day of the deadline because the deadline is actually 5 p.m. on that day. Go up to the day before, all right? To always give yourself a little of insurance policy. Earnest money is an expensive thing to, loss, to lose. And if we as the realtors are the ones who lost it because the client didn't understand it, guess whose pocket it's gonna come out of? So we really need to make sure we are doing this and protecting our buyer's money. And this multiple offer world that we're living in and this hectic world of running and showing houses and writing quick offers, it's just so, I just can't even emphasize enough. Again, follow the contracts, use these different forms, the form of the real estate purchase contract, the form of the contingent cancellation, the form of the resolution of the due diligence addendum, and the buyer's notice of cancellation. Let's make sure as agents, we are being the professional and we do not ever, ever risk the earnest money, okay? We're gonna go back into our PowerPoint now and move forward. I'm trying to keep this class under a half an hour and we're about halfway through. So let's get rid of those forms now that we're done with them and just get back into. So we've talked about um, if the addendum is not accepted by 4 p.m. the day before the deadline, what you can do. You can use those different forms to make sure you extend it. Do not put your acceptance of the addendum past five o'clock. Any deadlines are always five o'clock of the date written, all right? And that's always kind of a little bit um, confusing to some. So the seller disclosure date and what we're doing with the seller's disclosures, we've kind of been over. And now the inspection date. Negotiating repairs, let's talk about that a little bit, all right? I am always happy to negotiate repairs verbally with the other agent because I think it makes things cleaner and faster as long as my inspection deadline gives me enough time to do that. So when I'm gonna order the inspection, I get the inspection done a good three or four days before the inspection deadline. And then that gives me time to sit and discuss that with my client and also to sit and discuss it with a seller's agent, okay? It's okay to do that and then put it all in writing. It's okay to do it, but just make sure you don't miss anything when you actually put it in writing. And know when you're verbally and texting 
these, these extensions or these repairs, that this is all just discussion. It is not legally binding. It is not legally binding, okay? Because text can get altered, as we all know. People are techie out there. So text can get altered and things can happen. So in order to have a binding contract, everything must be in writing. Just that, but it doesn't mean that you can't discuss it verbally first. A lot of agents will just send the resolution addendum without any discussion, and then they get a they get a they get a rejection of that resolution addendum, and and then they're just kind of all messed up, and they don't know quite what to do. And I think us as realtors, it's okay to pick up the phone and talk with the other agent, and have that other agent talk with their client, and then put all the paperwork together. Okay, so make sure you're aware of the forms, that you're aware of the dates in section 24. You're aware of the negotiating. You're aware of the resolution of due diligence form. You're aware of the contingent cancellation form. Love the contingent cancellation form, by the way. That's a newer form. And then you love the, the seller's resolution of due diligence form. That you get so good at those that you just love using those forms and you know exactly what you're doing. So that's the discussion of inspection date and the waiving and the home warranty and all of that. So let's go on to the next one. Where are we at? Addendum clause. So if the addendum is not accepted by 4 p.m. before the deadline, another thing that you can put in an addendum is this contract will automatically cancel and blah, 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 earnest money will be, re be released to the buyer, okay? This is another little clause, if you will. I really, really want us to use this contingent cancellation form, but if you can't use it for whatever way the wording is or something that you're trying to do, you can always do a clause. I'm going to tell you this, if you end up in front of the grievance committee or the professional standards committee, the, the, the forms that the UAR has are always going to be your best bet. So use the UAR forms before you start using uh, some sort of clause or some sort of uh, company form. That makes sense. Um, on to the next. Not that you can't use them, it's just you're going to stand up in court better if you don't and stand up at professional standards and all of that. Financing appraisal deadline. 24C. Things to remember. Okay, in a multiple offer situation right now, some people are paying blah, blah, blah above appraisal. So this would mean you will have to provide a copy of the appraisal to the seller in order to use this clause, okay? And escalation clauses that, um, you know, you're, you're willing to escalate your offer $1,000 above appraisal or $1,000 above the other offers contingent upon appraisal. Keep all this in mind and keep it all straight. It's going to be very confusing for your buyer. So try to go over these offers in person instead of DocuSign. And if you have to send them DocuSign, get up on the phone with them and point out areas that you're concerned about. Because we want to make sure that they do not lose their earnest money, that they do not lose inspection money, and that they do not lose appraisal money. We need to protect our buyer's money. And how we do that is all contractual. It's all in the contracts. And it's all in making sure we explain it to them and even having them initial over on releasing earnest money or initial over by the, we're waiving our inspection. Because that means you've explained it to them and they understand it and they're acknowledging that. We don't ever want to get into a he said, she said with our client because that doesn't get, get us any referrals. But we absolutely want to win on multiple offers. Okay, buyer's notice of cancellation. Saving your buyer's costs. And I've kind of gone over that, but I'm gonna go over it one more time. Earnest money, release of earnest money, additional earnest money. Make sure you go over those with your buyer. Inspection costs, additional inspections, and title. And even title costs for your seller and buyer. There can be costs, I've seen title companies do that, not very often. Appraisal costs, and appraisal required in repairs, and then the cost of those repairs, the stress and the missed work and all of that. Everybody wants to get the home they want, right? We all do. We all want to get the home they, we want. They, we want our offers to be picked, but we also want to make sure that our buyer understands exactly what's going on. So if we're needing an extension for financing, or if we're needing an extension because there's some appraisal required repairs, or there's some inspection repairs that we're still negotiating. Let's make sure to get those forms into play well before our buyer has spent the money and, and, and is gonna lose their earnest money. All of this, again, to sum it all up, 
can be handled during the buyer consultation and during the offer period. We want to make sure that we are protecting our own selves, we're protecting our buyer, we're protecting our brokerage because the brokerage does not want to pay your earnest money for you. Okay. And we love our better realtors. So let's make sure if you didn't understand anything that you pick up the phone or email Kathy at dot better homes at gmail.com or just give me a call at 801-726-3984. I really, really, really appreciate all of you. This actual recording will be put on our all things BHGRE page and it'll be emailed out on Monday. And I hope you guys have a fabulous, fabulous rest of your Thursday. Thanks so much and, um, and have a great day, okay?